This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. We have a jam-packed episode for you ladies and gents, a real treat coming up for you. Firstly I'll be joined by director Alberto Corridor who is uh, stopping by Under the Stairs to discuss his brand new horror movie which has just made its way to digital on the 5th of April and Blu-ray and DVD in the UK via Studio Canal um, on the 8th of April. The movie is of course Baghead. Now I think in the States this is already available on Shudder. I don't think it's available in the UK on Shudder so kind of have to go and either purchase it or buy the physical copy. But yeah, we're going to sit down and chat to him a little bit about the movie. I got about 20 minutes with him, so it's a really cool, fun conversation. And then right after that, we will be jumping into my review, which may contain mild spoilers of the movie Baghead itself. So as always, if you're checking this out as a video on YouTube, use the chapters, jump around. If you're doing the audio version of this just be mindful there will be a time code in the listen so if you've not seen the movie yet you don't want it spoiled don't want any of those details but want to check out that badass interview then use your due diligence if you are one of the few in the proud who don't care about such matters like movie spoilers even when you've not seen a movie then just hang around don't say that you weren't warned so let's do a mild transition shall we and then when i return i'll be joined by alberto corridor director of baghead right after this And welcome back, ladies and gents. So I am privileged and uh, greatly, greatly grateful that I am joined today by uh, director Alberto, who has a brand new movie out, Baghead. Um, it has, uh, it's got its um, release via Studio Canal, and it's out this month on digital, Blu-ray, and DVD. Alberto, welcome to the podcast under the stairs. How's it going? Thank you for having me, Duncan. Um, I. Well, one, I'm incredibly excited to be chatting to you because it's always great for a director to finally get their movie out on digital and, and all the, the, the physical media out there. I'll also be honest, I'm super jealous because you got a chance to work with Peter Mullen, who's kind of <laughs> a national hero in Scotland. We absolutely love him. Um, so, you know, you, you're, you've been closer to Peter Mullen than I have. But I want to talk a little bit about the... How this movie came to go from the short film to the the feature? Can you tell me a little bit about what that process was? Is that a case of you released the short film, it did really well, and you're approached by a studio, or were you already thinking when you made the short, I mean, this would work as a feature? Yeah, it, it was from the beginning. The plan was to use it as a springboard. It, it was a proof of concept to to get into a feature. Mm-hmm. The the truth is, when when I shot the short, I was actually I mean, to, to shoot a low budget uh, feature long film. Um, and I was trying to find collaborators and so on. But then uh, the script for Backhead from, from Lorcan, Lorcan Riley, uh, landed on my lap and I read it and I thought, yes, this is, this is really good. You cannot pass on this. I didn't want to shoot another short, but uh, it was so good. And I could see already that the, the character uh, had the potential to be iconic and to mm-hmm. do a really nice transfer into a, a, a long story that I decided to go ahead with it. So I sat down with Lorca and we agreed that we were doing this together and that we were going to try to uh, to find buyers later for the concept. Um, so we shot the short at the end of uh, 2017. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a festival run of almost two years. Uh, trying to find the, the right people to, to mm-hmm. get the project uh, going. And yeah, at some point we met the, the people uh, from Good Fear at the time. 
uh, Jake Wagner, who is my manager now, was part of Good Fear. And mm -hmm. he was the one who started everything to, to get into motion, find me, finding me representation, uh, putting me in touch with uh, producers, with, with studios and so on. And in the end, we, we met Andrew Rona and Alex Heinemann from the picture company. They had a, a deal with, with Studio Canal, a multi-film uh, deal. Um, and they were really, really looking forward to, to do something in, in the horror arena. Mm -hmm. And they thought that the concept in Backhead were, was very good and they wanted to expand it in the, into the future. And that's how it happened. That's brilliant. Um, I, I, obviously, the, the, there's um, in the press statements I get sent around, they, they liken the movie to, to, to recent horror movies that came out. But I actually found it had a much more traditional feel, like that kind of single set location, you know, house with the creepy basement and all the rest. It plays into a lot of well-established horror tropes. Um, your background as, you know, a, as a filmmaker a, a, and a horror fan, um, is that the sort of genre of horror, subgenre of horror that you like to play around in, in the kind of supernatural world, or is it a case of you're a lover of all horrors, this is the first one that you're doing, and we should keep our eyes open for kind of more horrors and other genres? Yeah, it's funny because uh, I love every every kind of horror. For me, what was uh, very attractive in the story is that I had this, this iconic character, this character that that had the potential to really, really be something different. Yeah. Um, and that's how I, how, how the, the, uh, the story came, came forward. It's not like uh, me, myself, I'm, I'm only looking to do supernatural horrors because mm -hmm. um, I'm more open. Uh, in fact, I tend to think that in, in the horror arena, and I really want to, to stay in, in genre uh, filmmaking at, at the moment, I'm more interested in what drives actual human beings without the supernatural element mm -hmm. to get to extreme lengths and to really bring out the worst of uh, that is in, in everybody because I think the human condition is the mo most interesting part of the story. So in a sense, yes, I'm open. I, I always like uh, supernatural stories, but I think for the next one, I'm more looking forward to, to introduce more current themes. Yes. Yeah, I think like when you talk about the human condition, like obviously the character of Baghead is, you know, it's a terrifying entity, uh, and and you get some great shots of horror in this movie. But the the bit that grounded me was that idea of, like, when someone passes on, when someone dies, you're always left with regret or questions, and the ability to at first have that you know that channel to be able to communicate. But then how quickly that becomes a crutch, a dependency on itself. You know, that answer to that one question is never enough because there'll always be another question or you maybe doubt how someone acted with you. And like the movie plays out really well. And that's why I think the, the casting of uh, Peter Mullen is genius. He has a face that looks like he's like lived 20 lifetimes. Um, yeah. You know, he's, he's just got that kind of weathered look in his face and he's, he's He's brilliant in the role. Can you talk to me a little bit about the casting? Because this is a great cast that you've pulled in for your debut feature. I mean, look, a lot of debut features, you might be able to land one kind of identifiable name and there's a lot of kind of up and comers, but you've got people from The Witcher, Bridgerton, um, you, like like things that have traction on Netflix and with millions of viewers around the world. Um, how did that casting process come along? Did, do you get much of a say in that or is that done by like a separate casting agent who feeds, this is who we think is best for the role here? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Like everything in, in this in this kind of project, when you work for, for a studio, uh, for me it was the first big project. So <laughs> I was a, a bit overwhelmed with the whole thing. But you realize how collaborative everything is. We we did have a, a casting a casting agent, uh, but it was also the studio and the producers looking for opportunities. The reality is that the first the first draft for for the story had a bit older uh, mm -hmm. protagonist. We always wanted to have a kind of a family story and with a female protagonist. But um, Andrew Rona and Alex Heinemann from the picture company had already worked uh, with with Freya. In, in one of the previous movies, and everyone mm -hmm. was raving about it, even if it was a very small uh, small road in, in that film. 
So when they put it forward to me uh, and I spoke to Freya, I knew already the Witcher. I, I had watched the series and I really, I really saw her her potential. Mm -hmm. um, I was over the moon. I mean, obviously, it's something that always helps the the process. And once you have your protagonist, in this case Freya, then is when you start uh, going through the through the casting process. Yes. It was really tricky because at the time we were coming out of uh, of the uh, lockdown during COVID. Yeah, yeah. So everyone was trying to get all the all the projects going, uh, trying to cast, trying to get crew. So it was scrambling around to find <laughs> the right people. But I, I can tell you that that uh, probably one of the happy, happiest days of my life is when when Andrew Rona came to me and, and and he asked me this question like, what do you think about Peter Mulan? And oh. it, it was like, who did you just say? Did you say <laughs> Peter Mulan, the Peter Mulan? Yeah. And it was uh, one of these things, uh, Serendipity, Peter, you know, he was uh, kind of available at the time for mm -hmm. for, a few, for a couple of weeks. Um, and his family, his, his sons have told him that when are you going to do another horror movie? Because you, you haven't done a horror movie since Session 9. Session and, 9, that's right. Yeah, a classic that, that is, is incredible, the movie. So it was just being there the, the right time. Uh, and Peter is a, is a fantastic person. He's, he's really, really a character. He's more than you see. In, it's bigger than what you see in, yeah. in, on screen, <laughs> which is uh, to say something. I, I really... A really true gentleman and a pleasure to work with him. Yeah. So like this movie now, like I said before, it's you know it's went through its theatrical run. This is now making its way to digital, uh, DVD and, and Blu-ray available um, uh, this month. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the the kind of timeline then? So you started shooting just out just out of lockdown. Um, how long was the shoot? Was it? Are we talking like weeks, months? Um, how long was that process? Yeah, the, it, it was all very frantic because, as I say, we were producing uh, the, the script, writing, mm -hmm. working on it, then lockdown hit uh, with COVID and so on. So everything was a bit flimsy. Nobody knew if the project was going to really see the, the light of day. Yeah. And then when, when lockdown uh, finished and, and they opened up, uh, the studio realized, realized, OK, this is an opportunity. Let's green light the project and let's go. So it was from that moment we had like seven weeks in in summer to two thousand and twenty one yeah, yeah. Uh, to do the pre production and another six weeks uh, to do shooting. So it was very very compact and and yes a lot of scrambling around. Then when we finished we had planned to to have another additional day after mm -hmm. doing the edit and putting everything together. The idea was is is kind of something that that is the trend to do now. You mm -hmm. see, you're ready, you, you uh, show it to a few people and then you decide, okay, maybe we can shoot this and this and this to make it a bit better. Mm -hmm. The problem was that at the time uh, Freya had started already shooting uh, another season of The Witcher. Okay. So he had to be in hiatus and wait for almost half a year until we could shoot, uh, we could shoot that, that extra day. So that that made the project go quite, quite for a long way. So it ended the, the principal photography in 21 and, mm -hmm. and it came out uh december last last year so it's been a, a quite a long process um in the interim have you been I, I can't imagine someone who's you know finally got their their you know their claws into the studio system in future like have you been working on other projects i know that you'll be restricted on what you can tell us and what you can't tell us but were you actively working on other projects or was this a case of you could continue doing like refinements and edits to what you had there and you just kind of have to wait until um, your cast is available? No, what well, you realize pretty quickly uh, is in this business you always have to have something moving <laughs> because it takes so long uh, and so much, so few projects are, are green-lighted that, that you always have to have at least another couple of projects running. So mm -hmm. while I was doing uh, um, uh, Backhead, I, I had already started working with a writer and producers and on another story that is now with with uh, um, Matt Chance, Andrew Lassa's production company. It's kind of a, a throwback to the Cold War era with uh, with uh, American barracks uh, in the mountains of Germany. 
Um, and that piggybacks a little bit on the current situation the, with the war uh, between Russia and the Ukraine, mm -hmm. throwing a, a, a monster into the mix uh, to, add, to add some fun. That's that's one of the projects. And also after after doing back I realized that I wanted to, to, to get my fingers dirty in terms of the writing, because mm -hmm. that gets you closer to the story and gets you closer to what you are re actually want to do and the yeah. story that you want to tell. So I started working on on a kind of a dystopian story with Stephen Herman, a really great uh, writer that I met through through my uh, agents. And I would say something like A Quiet Place meets Mandy, because I'm, oh, wow. I'm, I'm kind of, I like dystopian stories, but I also like, like I said before, really extreme stories where you put your characters into extreme situations and mm -hmm. a lot of violence um backhead is for me an exception because it's a pg movie and i don't see myself as a pg director so yeah i want actually that the next one really shows uh what my passion is in terms of the the filmmaking but even more in terms of the storytelling phenomenal i i always love it when directors like stay in the genre it's greed like well like you know there's there's a lot of directors use it as a springboard to because you can make horror movies relatively cheap and then you you know jump away and do something else it's always great to you know to keep people that are kind of uh, are coming up through the genre you know getting their getting their start in it i suppose the 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 obvious question from my point of view without going into any spoilers about the movie this movie does set up the potential for a sequel um is that something that's being discussed or is that uh you know we'll just leave that door open and we'll see what I, happens i think it's a it's a matter of of you you always have that door open i think uh, yeah. when you're when you're working in the studio system and so on. it depends if there is willingness from from, from part of of the studio producers but for all uh from the audience in my particular opinion is personal opinion is um I would be more interested in see uh, to see what happened before the story that was shown. Yes, me. yes, that that's right. Happens yeah. after. I'm a big fan of paganism and the uh, witch hunt and and what happened before and why, how these women were wrongly done by uh, by a very male dominated uh, culture at the yeah. time. So I think that that is what I would like more to to visit if there is there is more uh but that for 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 this story to to continue said that um i've been working on this project for for six years so i think <laughs> it's probably for me time to move out of the basement <laughs> and leave the week alone <laughs> that's great that's great to hear um the last thing i wanted to kind of ask on and kind of touch on it is some directors have quite a, a like a, a hands-on approach to how the score of a movie, how the soundtrack is going to fit in, and others actually maybe less so. They're more involved with to get the score delivered to them, and then they kind of make it fit those parts. Um, your experience working on Backhead, how involved were you on that? Did you have quite a lot of say on what sort of soundtrack you wanted in the in the movie? Because while, while I was listening to it, it's it's very subtle. But it works really, really well. It ramps up tension exactly when I, I was. There were certain bits in the movie that I felt uneasy watching, and it wasn't because there was anything happening on the screen. And I realised it was actually how the score was being used in the background. So, how involved were you in that process? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it, it was great to, to work with Suvi, the the composer. She's great. I mean. From the beginning, uh, when we were looking for for a composer, I already told the producers and the studio, I don't want to have a classic horror movie score. I yeah. want to have something that really ties up with this concept of paganism, with witchcraft. Mm -hmm. um, so I was going through many interviews and meetings with composers, but I couldn't find what I was looking for. So I started looking myself until I, I found online uh, Suvi, and, and I asked directly to the music, uh, to Nick Angel, the, the music coordinator, can, can we actually have someone like like this woman, like Suvi? So we uh, we get, got in contact with her and we spoke about it. And from the very beginning, I, I knew it was the right person but it, mm -hmm. because she understood. I wanted to have non-classic instruments and instruments that remind you to this earthy feeling like bones, like stones, mm -hmm. like scratching 
around um, some of the voices and so on. And we discussed every single scene in, in terms of which kind of feeling we wanted to have. And she went a step farther, like trying to find themes for, for all the characters, finding the backhead theme, finding the Irish theme and so on. So if there is something that I'm really, really proud about in this process is the, is the, the way we co collaborated for, for the soundtrack because I think it's something that you can sit down and, and listen to now that it's, it's, it's out there, the whole mm -hmm. sound, and really appreciate the, the great work that Suvi has done. Yeah, I think it's I, th I think you hit the nail on the head with that. I think if you went down the classical road, um, it could have felt a little too old fashioned. Um, and that it, it's just it's a very creepy soundtrack. It, it works really, really well. Um, I can't thank you enough for for joining me uh, to chat about this movie i know it's, it's probably been a very busy week for you with the the movie now being out came out digital on the 5th of april um it came out in blu-ray on the 8th so you're you'll be uh you'll be very busy um answering a lot of the same questions but thank you very much for for spending a bit of time alberto chatting to me today do you do you exist on like social media is there any place that people should be following you like on an instagram or anything or do you try and avoid I, that i have an instagram account i'm not the best one at, at uh, posting stuff and so on i'm more old school on, on that stuff i i really have fat fingers and i don't like doing <laughs> and, and so on but i try my best and try yeah. my best and if you want to keep up with all my projects and how back it is doing you can follow me on instagram yes Perfect. Thank you very much, Alberto. Ladies and gents, go and check it. Backhead is available on digital and it's available on DVD and Blu-ray via Studio Canal. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. This property comes with a special tenant. Lives in the basement. She's tied to the property. And now that your name is on the title deeds, you're her guardian. You can't escape this place now. You're the one thing that stands between her and the outside world. And that now is your sole task. You cannot let her out of the basement. You don't know yet how dangerous she is, but she is and you will. But tonight, her curse ends with me. If you're watching this, then I've failed. Welcome back. So you've just seen the teaser trailer for Bankhead. Like I said in the intro, this movie was released in digital in the UK on the 5th of April. It is released um, on Blu-ray and on DVD, so physical, on the 8th of April via Studio Canal in the UK. Big thanks to uh, the director for joining me there for a little bit of a conversation on the movie itself. Now, we'll give you some pretty pictures, stills from the movie, as I talk you through the details from the press statement. Backhead, the supernatural horror thriller from the producers of It and Barbarian, is released on digital, Blu-ray and DVD this April. It stars Freya Allen of The Witcher and Jeremy Irvin of Warhorse. The film is the feature debut of director Alberto Corridor. Adapted from Corridor's award-winning short film of the same name, Backhead also stars Ruby Barker of Bridgerton, Peter Mullen of Top of the Lake, Saffron Burrows of You and Julika Jenkins of Dark. Released in the UK cinemas this uh, earlier this year, released in UK cinemas earlier this year, Backhead features a superb lead performance from Alan in this feature film starring Debuting as a must-see for fans of horror smash hits like Smile and Talk To Me. Backhead will be available on digital on the 5th of April and on Blu-ray and DVD from the 8th of April. The synopsis of the movie is, Following the death of her father, a young woman inherits a run-down pub and discovers a dark secret within the basement. Backhead, a shape-shifting creature that will let you speak to your lost loved ones, but not without consequence. So yeah, that's um, that gives you a rundown on on Baghead, which I'll be honest with you, I was expecting very little. For I have, 
I'm kind of burned out with cinema horror at the moment, if I'm honest. And when it did come to UK cinemas, I skipped it, which is just the fatigue of a lot of kind of middling horror movies that have come out of late. Um, there have been... In fact, 2024 has been not the greatest year for horror thus far. Yes, we have many movies still to come, but um, finding the ones that are really kind of stuck with me or the ones that have really been delivering is kind of few and far between, if I'm honest. So I kind of approached this one cynically expecting very little. And Baghead, whilst it's not the most original movie that you're going to see, and to be honest, it's it does follow beats that are traditionally tropes of the genre, there's enough in here that I actually <laughs> I was taken a little bit back by the fact that this was like a feature movie debut for director Alberto Corridor. Um, I suppose the, the things that I liked and then we'll do the things that I disliked, we'll give it a grade, we'll do some mild spoilers, but the thing I liked about the movie is I think the performances are really, really good. I think it helps that he managed to secure pretty good actors out the back for his debut feature. You don't often see that. I am not ashamed to say massive Peter Mullen fan. Um, he is, of course, a fellow Scot, which helps. But I feel that that man has many years that he probably hasn't even tapped into his experience, lived upon his face. It's just a, a very well-worn face that his role as the, the kind of gatekeeper to a supernatural force um, really kind of won over for me. He also hasn't really done much in the way of horror movies, plenty of thrillers, he played plenty of sinister characters, but I can't remember the last time maybe out with a Session 9 where he's just played like a character in an out and out horror movie, so it was a, a real treat to see. I think the idea and central premise of the movie is actually one that is... Even though the synopsis, and this is why I hate reading press statements, is like that, oh, it's in the same vein as Smile, and it's in the same vein as Talk To Me. It's actually like neither movie. Um, and Talk To Me, yes, you're communicating with the dead, but you're not communicating with the dead to get answers. And Smile, I don't know where the comparison to that has come at all. I think that's like just uh, out with the fact that they're both cinematic horror movies. Question mark. Um... This one plays with, like, something that's tangible. And Corridor, when I was speaking to him in that interview, had mentioned he was more interested about the human condition. I actually find that that's the bit that's that's more interesting overall in the movie, is that idea of what is ingrained in the human condition after death is usually questions. Uh, we question our own mortality more than we probably admit we do. And I love this idea of... That's why people go to psychics, why people go to mediums, why people, you know, want to know their future or speak to people beyond the grave. It's because we all have that that one question we wish we had asked um, or that one interaction that we maybe passed up that we instantly regret because that person's no longer there. The ability to tap into that um, is something I imagine would be very addictive. And the movie plays out that way, you know, with an entity that can essentially allow you that conduit of conversation. But the, the, the cost is is telling and, you know, you're in this power struggle all the way right through. The movie is short. I mean, we're talking under an hour and a half. It gets in, gets out, does what it needs to do. And even the scenes where we get kind of expository sequences of giving you a bit of the history, there, there's a whole, it's interesting because the director himself said that if he was to return to it he would like to do a prequel, but there's a whole mythology set up around, you know, what created the baghead, the people that were involved in the, you know, owning the pub or the, the kind of area in which the, the spirit comes back. That idea is very well fleshed out. So those sections of exposition in the movie are actually done surprisingly smart considering its short runtime. I got a feeling that I understood who these characters were. I got a feeling that I understood the confines and the mythology around the creature. Um, I actually think a lot of the, the effects on the creature itself are really, really well done considering one, the budget, two, the timescale, and three, that this was made during COVID. Um... 
you know, it stands out, well, sorry, slightly post-COVID, but in a world which was right after COVID. I thought all those things hung together really, really well in that short time. I think the score to this movie is what sells it for me. I mentioned in the, the previous interview there that, to me, there were sections of this movie where very little was actually happening, but I felt dread. And that dread was borne out because of what the, the the score to the movie was doing. So I think that is done very, very, very well. Some of the things that I didn't like about the movie, I did feel that at times it kind of felt like bits of this movie were very reminiscent of a lot of movies that I've seen, which... As a criticism I throw out against a lot of modern horror purely from the fact that I'm 42 years old now. I've been watching horror movies since I was 8 years old. I've seen more horror movies than I would like to count. And as a result, to get something that feels like it is uh, is coming in from a fresh point of view or a different angle is few or far between. If I was, you know, a, a relative newbie to the horror genre or someone that occasionally dabbled. There's a whole lot of this that would feel fresh, invigorating and an original, but to me I maybe get a little bit less of that. I personally would have had more Mullen on screen. Um, I think we get... Uh, he's used well, but to me he's such an interesting actor to have on screen that I would have had a bit more of him, but that's a selfish part of my you know, morbid fascination and overall probably stalkerish nature towards a great actor. Um, I also feel that the ending, which I can't obviously talk about in too much detail, is an ending that seems to be more popular nowadays. Um, and I'm not saying that I disliked it, it's just it didn't maybe hit me the same way I think maybe the director felt it was going to hit audiences. And once again, that comes from experience. So if you're on the side of people that see very little horror movies and it probably did feel like, oh, this like never saw that one coming, kind of saw it coming from early on in the movie. Uh, notwithstanding that though, I think the casting was really well done. For a short stretch out over a feature, this is how you do it. I think of movies like Mama, which had this incredible shot, and then by the time they came to meet the feature of it, it felt like there was a lot of a lot of padding in there. Baghead doesn't suffer from that at all. It actually surprisingly keeps up a relatively quick pace throughout its runtime. So yeah, overall, good acting, good story. Maybe not the most original thing that I've seen. Maybe some sequences that kind of felt very reminiscent of other horror movies. Great score and surprisingly good for a debut feature. Overall, I would give this movie a three and a half out of five. I would say if it's out available on digital, check it out. It's, it's certainly it's an hour and a half. I mean, that's you know that's that's an easy easy mission is to sit down with some popcorn with a family and you uh, I, my. Uh, I might as well say this, my, uh, my 10 year old watched this with me, so it's not a, a movie that kids can't watch. Um, whilst it aims for scares, it doesn't aim overtly for scares or jump scares, so it kind of avoids the trappings of that. It does set itself on a more traditional kind of supernatural bent. So there you go, that is some details on the movie. I think I got through that with minimal spoilers. If I have mentioned something that has completely spoiled your interest in the movie, I do apologise, but you were warned up front. So yeah, Baghead is available in the UK as of the 5th of April. It was available on digital. It's available physically on DVD and in Blu-ray via Studio Canal. And that was of the 8th of April, so that was last week. It's available wherever you check out fine movies, whether it's online or uh, purchasing from a store. Three and a half from this guy. So, there we go. That's your review. Uh, a huge thanks to the director. A huge thanks to the PR company and a huge thanks to you for joining me on this episode. Check in it out. If you're checking us out on YouTube, then hit us a little subscribe and give us a little like. All those things support what I do on this channel. Of course, um, you could leave a little comment. Have you checked it, Backhead? What do you think about it? Do you agree? Do you disagree? How's your 2024 been for horror? Like, uh, is it just me that's been cynical? But I just kind of feel like it's been... I feel like we're treading a lot of water here and the big movies have still to land and I'm kind of looking forward 
to when they do. So leave some comments in there as well. But of course, like and subscribe. If you're checking us out on Spotify or Anchor through the video podcasting apps that they have, then answer the question that pops up at the end of this episode and also subscribe. You'll see there's a theme here. And then lastly, if you're checking out the audio content for this podcast on any of the podcatchers that are available out there, then hit subscribe there as well. You get access to the over 1,300 episodes of the podcast under the stairs going all the way back 10 years, but also uh, every episode that we drop in the future. Lastly, all that's left for me to say is wherever you are, what are the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off.